you. Thank you all so much. This has been a terrific weekend um, for me, as I hope it has been for all of you. And I just want to say it's been such a privilege for me to be here with all of you because one of the things that is most important to me is civil conversation and civic engagement. And to see it on such a scale here across Maine, and I know from meeting many of you um, that you've come also from across New England and from Pennsylvania, and someone came up to me who had come from Florida. So I I think it's wonderful that you're doing this. I wish we had a Camden conference in every state or every region because um, it's so important. So I, it, it gives me a really special pleasure to hear from all of you. It's like hosting a radio show, which I love being able to do too, and getting your voices heard. And you have such an incredible opportunity here with these wonderful speakers. So um, we're going to vary it all over. I just want to remind all of you to try to make your questions brief in the interest of sharing the time with your fellow citizens who also want to have their voices heard and their questions answered. And we'll be taking questions from all the locations, um, not just here in Camden, but also Belfast, Rockland, and Portland. All right, so I see that some people are already queued up and ready to go, fired up. So let's start back here. Thank you. My name is Lee Sherrill, and I come from Southport, Maine. To learn more about these issues, we depend on what we see and on what we hear. And I have read that advances in IT now allow very realistic doctoring of images and voices. How can we, as ordinary citizens, sort out what has been doctored and what is true? And how does this doctoring contribute to the world disorder? OK, I'm going to partly answer that question, because this is partly a journalism and a fake news and a, a disinformation question. And then I'll turn it over to others. There are a lot of. Um, resources out there that can allow you as, as a citizen to check things from Google image search to be able to see whether that picture that you see of the shark supposedly in the highway um, you know in Houston during Hurricane Harvey no that was fake that same shark appears every time there's some flood you know the shark appears on the highway not real um, so you know there you can look at the International Fact Checking Network which is housed at Pointer at the Institute where I work um, you can look up those resources online and they give all sorts of citizen tools to help you check what you see out there and know whether the information that's out there is true or false. And there are many people here who I think would know more about that. Let me turn to um, Avril Haynes because um, I also wanted to mention that Avril Haynes and Matthew Goodwin are going to have to leave us early. So if you have specific questions for the two of them um, to try to direct them early on in the conversation. So Avril, since you've dealt with, at the CIA and the NSC, you've dealt with disinformation. What are some tips that you can give for helping ordinary citizens sort out what's true and false? Sure. I, I th can't add much, frankly, to what you've said. The only thing I would say is that, uh, in general, I do think that the degree of information that we're receiving from a variety of different sources does add to the disorder, to your specific question. And in my own view, one of the things that we need to do more effectively is build up the institutions that we uh, believe can and should provide reliable information. And in the media, in my view, that is a place where we need to focus, and in really just uh, helping, essentially, those institutions within the media that do provide reliable information, that subscribe to certain guidelines, and that are the kinds of institutions that you then can go to to check whether or not the information that you're hearing from other sources is accurate and whether there are issues is a critical piece of trying to sort of go down this road further and actually have a better conversation in the public from my perspective. It's a very difficult issue overall because I think generally the distrust which we've seen not just in this country but in many other countries of public institutions, of governments, adds to the problem and public institutions includes in many scenarios the media and that's a place where we're going to have to actually address the issue so that we can find places where there is reliable information that we trust. Um, Natalie, I want to turn to you for just a moment on this because um, as a French journalist, um, you'd be aware that there was a really strong movement by the fact-checking 
sort of industry, if we can call it that, but fact checking, um, to come in ahead of the French election and to, in real time, disprove things that were being put out um, in the election. And it, and it did have an effect in the same way that we didn't have a sort of organized way to counter what was going through our internet space and our social media space. In contrast, in France, you had a very organized campaign. But it's not just that, it's also that um, the French media did not put out in the 24 hours before the election a bunch of documents that supposedly would have been damaging to uh, Macron. And maybe you can tell us a little bit about that decision. Yes, that- uh, Unlike the Hillary Clinton email and, the F and all that yeah, other stuff. Sure, I think um, on that particular thing of, of why the French media did not use um, the material that, was, that had been leaked, and the, the Macron leaks, um, there was there was um, there's a, there was a piece of legislation. There's a piece of legislation in France that says that you don't you don't campaign in, the, in those last 24 hours. So they were they 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 had a, a decision to take the editors of all those different media organizations. But the other thing that and I think was, was the most important reason why they restrained themselves from using that material is that the people within the, camp the Macron campaign made public that they had, they had been aware of the hacking of their emails and the campaign uh, headquarters for months and that they had made sure that the material that was taken was also uh, injected with false material that they hems themselves had produced. So false emails, false, so they, they kind of disqualified the whole material by letting it be known that you know they had manipulated the very content that had been uh, hacked and, and leaked. Wow. Yeah. That That's was, very interesting. So, as, as, yeah. <laughs> so you could say it's sabotage, but in its a way, it's sabotage that helped them yes. because they said, hey, media, if you print this, exactly. that half of it's going to exactly. be wrong. Exactly. That's very interesting. Well, I would imagine that the media would then follow up by then trying to figure out what if it was right, but that's another <laughs> that story. Time. <laughs> <laughs> um, did you want to add something, Steve? All right, well, I'm a, I'm a consumer of news, not a producer of it for the most part myself, and I'll just make three Quick points. First of all, I think we're learning we should not rush to judgment, right? Uh, that the first story you read may not turn out to be the right story because journalism often takes time to get the full story out. Uh, second, don't rely on just one source. Don't just read the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal, uh, but usually you want to read at least more than one newspaper or consume more than one media source. I usually find it valuable to read at least one thing that's not American. So the Financial Times or The Guardian or something like that. And then finally, um, we, you should place more value on news organizations that actually print retractions, right? Who are willing to admit that they're not infallible because, in fact, no one is infallible. And a news source that will tell you, you know, last week we got this thing wrong and now we're correcting it is actually a more reliable one than one that never admits it's ever been wrong about anything, so. Um, Ch Chaz, you wanted to say something briefly? Um, <clears throat> Uh, perhaps I'm an idealist, but um, it used to be that the that newspapers, the press, performed a filter function, checking facts before printing them as facts. And there were some newspapers prided themselves on their reputation for not helping to delude the public. Uh, I read the Wall Street Journal for its reporting. Uh, for precisely that reason. Um, uh, I don't read its editorials because I don't want to have apoplexy. <laughs> um, um, but um, I really think there is, this goes back to the heart of journalism. And um, if the journalists can't come up with a way of providing an honest and credible filter uh, for all of the distortions, including now uh, lip sync, uh, very realistic uh, lip sync uh, uh, the videos, uh, I think we're in deep trouble. Uh, I think this is a very valuable function and it awaits an effective response. Jerry, you wanted to add something. Um, sure, so it's the Wall Street Journal, two newspapers for the price of one. <laughs> <laughs> News and opinion. <laughs> we're very proud of that. Um, Look, I just would add two things very quickly. Technology creates problems. Technology then solves the problems it creates. I talked to a young student at Brown who's working on a program that will use 
word association um, uh, techniques to uh, filter out things that are uh, completely false news and then help consumers see that. Um, more importantly, I, I'll put in a plug for mainstream media, for legacy media. We're uh, often disparaged in uh, much more uh, harsh terms than the ones I just use these days. But look, in the business that I'm in, we are in the business of finding truth and, do, and, and producing it obje uh, objectively. And actually, there are consequences for being wrong. There are consequences in our mm -hmm. profession and there are consequences in the marketplace. So I do think we are in a period where flight to quality online in the news business is a answer, maybe the answer to the question that was just raised. I, I just want to add to that that I think there are two issues here. Since I work on trust in media and bolstering trust in media, there's on the one hand the supply side. We in the media have to provide information that we have verified, that we have checked. We have to be accountable when we make mistakes, which is what these guys were talking about. Look at legacy organizations. We print corrections. We print retractions. We explain when we've done things wrong. And you should be worried about things like, just to throw out one example, Fox News um, with the Seth Rich conspiracy. The DNC Seth Rich conspiracy never came out and took responsibility for saying, why did we get this story wrong? Who, these are the people whose heads are going to roll. This is why we did it. They never did. They just realized that their story was wrong and kind of quietly took it down after it did so much damage that was never undone. But a, a few quick things that there's that, the supply side, we have to be accountable, transparent, show how we do our work, show how the sausage is made. On the demand side, you, as consumers of the news, have to also be responsible consumers of the news. Check every website. Make sure you're looking at abcnews.com, not abcnews.co.ely.who knows what. A lot of the fake news websites masquerade as real news, and they're not. And do things like check fact-checking sites like PolitiFact um, and you know see whether the information that you've heard is true or not. All right. Right here, we have another question and reminder to say your name and your, where you come from. Thank you. Uh, Kate Taylor from North Haven, Maine. And I apologize for this elephant in the room question. Um, are, are, are we slipping into World War III? Mm. Um, mm. OK, well, I imagine that many people can answer that. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> um, I, well, Chaz had a lot of thoughts about that, so I do want to get to you, but let me start with Avril again, since you're the person closest to actual intel. Um, <laughs> I, um, I assume part of what you're asking about is the North Korea piece, and is that, okay, so I see a, a nod of the head, but go ahead. All right, so she's saying the big so, scope. She's saying North Korea is one part for those people who can't hear in the remote locations, but she's actually looking back to the whole arc of human history for the last century, back to the Treaty of Versailles. So go ahead, Avril. Easy question. You take it first, then Steve, then Chaz. Yeah, exactly. All right. I, I mean, I do think that um, if you're thinking about it in the broad scope and scheme of things, what, what I'd say is uh, I do think that pulling away from the international order, as I talked about in my piece, is problematic from the perspective that um, it leads to a scenario in which we are less likely, uh, in a sense, to have rules of the road that allow us to manage problems when they come up. And, um, and increasingly, you know, in today's world, I'd say the trend lines are we have more complex threats, we have them coming at us faster than they used to, simply because of the degree of mobility around the world. And, uh, and we have problems that tend to be, um, in effect, uh, interdisciplinary in a way that is not what it used to be. So in other words, um, you have uh, more expertise that is needed at the table to address the threats, right? There's sort of the technology, the environmental science, the other things that, that you, you know, didn't think about necessarily several decades ago in the context of national security or other issues. And finally, I'd say because of the diffusion of power, which is both in terms of of a multipolar world that people talk about, right? But also the empowerment of the individual
individual and the fact that non-state actors and individuals are capable of creating more significant threats than they used to be because of technology and other things. All of these things contribute to a scenario in which you have to manage a lot, as any government would have to, but particularly the United States, I'd say, in the sense that we tend to be a magnet for a fair amount in this region. And, uh, and as a consequence, you really need as much as possible to develop those international mechanisms that allow you to manage those threats before they come to the United States, as I mentioned. And, and I do think that unless we are capable of retooling ourselves, in a sense, and being capable of then engaging more effectively and bolstering and supporting those international mechanisms, and obviously the United States can't do it alone, it will be a number of countries, that we, we do have the, the potential to go down a road that uh, you know, creates an, a landscape in which a, a sort of a World War III is more possible. Uh, Steve. Um, so I'm going to try and uh, sound an, op an upbeat note on this. I don't think uh, we're facing the prospect of World War III, uh, because let's remember what we mean by World War III. We would mean a conflict, leaving nuclear weapons out of it for the moment. We're talking about a conflict involving great powers, China, Russia, the United States, uh, conceivably countries in Europe, Japan as well. That's what we mean by a world war, and I don't see that on the horizon uh, right now. Uh, first of all, no country, as far as I know, no country goes to war if it anticipates the prospect is going to be long, difficult, uncertain, and costly. Countries go to war when they've convinced themselves it will be, rightly or wrongly, it will be short, quick, cheap and easy. That's what we did, for example, when we went into Iraq. We'd fooled ourselves into thinking it was going to be a quick, short war. And if you start looking at the possibility of a great power conflict in the world today, there's no way to imagine it being anything but long, uncertain, costly, and difficult. And that's true regardless of which of these countries you're looking at. So as I look at the major powers in the world, I don't see any of them thinking that they would advance their prospects by going to war with one another. And that's different than the situation before World War I, where in my view Germany had convinced itself it had a strategy for, that made war attractive. It's certainly different than World War II, where Germany and Japan had convinced themselves that there was a strategy that made war attractive. So the good news here is there isn't, I think, much of a prospect of a genuine world war. What's, what's the United States been doing? As Chaz laid out clearly, we've been beating up on third-rate countries. Where we do not want to get into a serious tussle with any major powers. Uh, we're having enough trouble with the, with the smaller ones as well. So having said all that optimistic stuff, I'll add one other point, which is don't be complacent, because there's a lot of things we have seen in the last few years that none of us expected 10 or 15 years ago. So I hope I'm right, but let's guard against the possibility I might be wrong. Chaz, would you like to jump in briefly? Um, three quick points. First, if by world war you mean a global struggle, um, not necessarily on the model of World War I or World War II, um, we are engaged at present in a low intensity conflict that is becoming global as we try to curb and control the Islamic world um, and kill lots of Muslims and we have blowback. Um, and we have identity politics that feeds into that that is very disturbing of domestic tranquility everywhere in the world. So it is possible to think of that as a world war. If you mean um, a, uh, a nuclear war, uh, because I don't think you can take nuclear weapons out of the picture. Uh, if great powers get into a war, there is a real danger of escalation to the nuclear level. That's exactly why it's unlikely that they will do that. Uh, however, the United States at present is busily developing, apparently, a whole new class of tactical nuclear weapons. The purpose is to make nuclear weapons more useful on battlefields. That is an invitation to escalation. I think it is a very bad idea, but we're about to spend a trillion dollars doing that in part. There are other elements to it. Finally, I think if the question is about North Korea, we had a discussion of it yesterday. I was very struck. People asked a question about North Korea. They got an answer about the North Korean nuclear problem. Not about North, North Korea is a country. It's not a nuclear problem. It, has, it is a nuclear problem, but it's more than that. So 
The question really comes back, as I said earlier, what's the question you're asking? If the question is, can we get North Korea to give up its nuclear weapons, forget it. Because they have concluded that the only way to fend off regime change efforts is the same way the great powers do, namely with a nuclear deterrent. Um, if we ask a question about North Korea that isn't, you know, how do we get rid of their nukes, but how do we have a peaceful relationship with them in which deterrence is one element but not the only one, uh, then we begin to get other answers. But we haven't asked that question. Uh, and a final observation here is that the Cold War taught us a trick, which is that, you know, when threatened, deter. Well, the problem with deterrence is it freezes situations. And if the situation is frozen, it may evolve in the wrong direction over time and the danger of an explosion can actually go up. And that is the case with North Korea, where there's, I would argue, very little diplomacy has been applied and a lot of deterrence. And we've now come to a point where we have a possible nuclear confrontation. So I think we should ask, not, yes, we should ask how do we deter bad events, but then we should go on to ask, and how do we solve the problem that led to this confrontation? What is it that North Korea as a state needs to behave more reasonably? Perhaps assurances that we're not gonna do regime change. Um, might help. Anyway, I, uh, those are some observations. I don't believe we're going to have World War III. Uh, well, Chaz, you also mentioned, though, that you think the tactical nuclear program that's underway, <coughs> the research for which is underway in the Pentagon right now, is a foolhardy idea and doesn't make sense. And, you know, the way, again, how citizen engagement works is we can all write to our Congress people about that if we don't like it. Cleo, do you have a very quick, brief yeah, thought? Uh, well, I do. If you look at, if you look at World War II, uh, you know, when Britain declared war, that meant all the pink bits on the map declared war, right? That's why Canada was at war in 39 and not in 42. The situation is very different now. India isn't going to follow Britain into war. Uh, so the, the ability of huge blocks to go to war with each other has been greatly diminished. And at the same time, those uh, now component, what were component parts of the empires, uh, are making their own strategic decisions. So you know, India and Japan are building a port in Iran. The US knows about it, they, they're not complaining. There are other alliances that are happening that are creating uh, potential quieter strategic realignments that make it much more costly to have that kind of a war for many of the middle powers and minor powers. Thank you for reminding us again of geography. It's such an important perspective to have. All right, we have a question up from the balcony. Yes, uh, Stefano Tijerina from the University of Maine. And uh, so far, um, in general, we have seen a construct of a new world order that it seems to be Western-centric uh, in focus. Uh, history has shown that if we're drawing a new world, a new world order, uh, it seems that a, a lens that is uh, Western-centric will only lead to division and disenfranchisement. Uh, what's the role of the emerging markets, which has never been touched in this whole two days? Uh, it seems that this is only a a world of very few actors, but there's many more actors in the map. What is your views on this? And you're from the University of Maine, but where are you originally from? I'm from Colombia. From Colombia, okay, muy bien. All right, so Matthew, can you start us off on that? I, I feel that's really more a question for Thea, um, but I mean, I can take a pop at it. Um, I think the, the issue of emerging markets, absolutely right, perhaps we should have talked a little bit more about it. Um, but I think primarily that's going to have Two, two effects, one economic and the other demographic, uh, both of which uh, are going to play into some of the tensions that we've, we've been discussing in the conference. I think firstly, increasing economic competition from those markets is going to have a profound effect on the middle class in the West uh, and the lower middle class, and they're going to feel increasingly squeezed. Uh, and that will, that sense of loss, which was so integral to the Trump vote, is not going to disappear, I think it will accelerate. Um, but secondly, emerging markets may, in different ways, trigger further uh, migration flows as you get workers moving from one, one context to the other. And so that, 
that merging of economics uh, with demographics, I think, is going to uh, remain very much uh, with us. But I, I would defer to, to trade experts. Would anyone else like to? You, uh, you may want to mention something, Fee, about the Colombian free trade trade deal or something. Well, I, I think it's a great question, and thank you for sort of recentering the conversation. Um, you know, there's no question that that the world is changing in important ways, and and with the emerging markets and the emerging economies, and you know, countries looking to industrialize and to export and so on. I think it's more important than ever that we have multilateral rules that can harness that competition into a productive channel. I'm not a person who thinks that we should ch shut off trade. Uh, people maybe have a, a stereotype of that, but I believe that, that it is possible, and that's why U.S. leadership could have and should still be so important, because these trade relationships are very important to both the emerging nations and to the, the, the big powers. Um, but that if we, if we put as a priority uh, democracy and human rights and workers' rights and environmentally responsible trade, uh, I think those things can actually help build stronger democratic voices in some of the emerging markets and, for example, the unions. And that's one of the things uh, we have a great relationship with the AFL-CIO, my former employer, a great relationship with the Colombian unions. And, you know, trying to make sure that their voices are heard in the trade agreements and trying to make sure that the actual terms under which we're going to increase trade or integrate our economies actually can lift up and empower workers so that they can, you know, have at least a shot at, um, at negotiating and bargaining for their fair share of the wealth. Otherwise, you know, if the, it, the economic integration is just one where wealthy American companies take advantage of poor workers in other countries and raise prices on pharmaceuticals, then we're going to have more tensions, more inequality, and more instability. So that's why I'd like to see the U.S. and Europe, I think, can both play an important role. But up until now, I'd say most of the great powers have squandered that role and gone in the wrong direction. Chaz, you wanted to briefly add something? Um, if the question is, as I take it, a bit broader than trade, um, yesterday there was a question asked about the UN. There was a sort of a snicker in the audience when the UN was mentioned. I would have answered that question differently. Um, the utility of the UN is directly proportional to the effort you put into it. It is a way of accomplishing your own objectives by en enlisting others in support of them. It's a forum. Um, it's also much more, as was pointed out, than just the Security Council. and the General Assembly, but many specialized agencies. However, the UN Security Council represents the victors in World War II. Uh, France and Britain have a seat. Germany doesn't, nor does Japan. Uh, China's in there. India is not. Brazil is not represented. The Islamic world is not represented. If you want to solve the problem, you have to have the right people in the room. The UN Security Council doesn't put the right people in the room, so therefore, it either needs to be reformed or we need to find an alternative forum to recognize the added power of non-Western societies, China, India, Japan, uh, newly assertive, uh, and, and perhaps uh, countries in South America as well. However, a greater role for these countries should not induce us to be at all apologetic about Western values or to cede them to others. Uh, if we have something to apologize for, it is because we've not always lived up to our own values. But the values of democracy, the rule of law, constitutional government, due process, are something we should be proud of and defend. All right. Good. Thank you. All right. Let's go to a question from uh, one of our remote locations. Timothy Farrelly in Belfast asks, what should be the U.S. policy on immigration? I mean, Belfast. I'm sorry, the, the EU policy on immigration. Um, just yeah. a narrow question. OK, well, let's go to our Europeans. Um, why don't we go to Natalie first? Um, the short answer is um, it has to be um, it has to be a forward-looking, not an immediate crisis management policy. And uh, that's what makes it difficult because we're facing demographic trends, especially in Africa, that, that are going to be a big challenge for, for Europe. Um, essentially, when you talk to uh, 
human rights organizations who are very critical of EU policies on immigration currently, they say that the key thing is to create legal channels for people to be able to uh, reach the EU or apply, apply for asylum in the EU, I'm talking about asylum in this case, um, in a safe way, that they don't have to get on those boats in Libya and risk their lives crossing over to Lampedusa in Italy or from um, Morocco to Spain. So create those legal channels. Um, uh, and that's complicated, right, because you're not going to set up a, a, a visa application booth in the middle of the Libyan desert. So it's, it's complicated, right, to, to do that. You have to work upstream with, with African governments. The, on the wider question of immigration, Europe is going to need immigration. It, has demo, it, has, um, it, it cannot uh, afford its welfare states and its current uh, economic uh, setup, a social and economic setup, without that uh, demographic input. Um, a country like Italy is, is, has very low um, uh, fertility and um, very low prospects demographically. This, this is currently a worry within the political uh, debate in Italy. People are worried about their, their identity as Italians. Anyway, so. Um, so this is this is going to be this is a key question, and EU leaders have been grappling with it intensely and uh, not ex exactly successfully. Uh, at least it's since 2013, when, the, when that first catastrophe happened and 300 people died off the coast of Italy in, um, in October of 2013. So, um, uh, but the key thing I think is to set up legal channels so that people can be safe and apply safely for asylum. All right, Matthew, can you add to that? Well, it wouldn't be a conference if you didn't have a dispute between the French and the British. <laughs> <laughs> but, well, thank uh, you for providing that for there us. There you go. Just, just before I, I was I, waiting for the blowback. <laughs> just before I quietly uh, sneak out the side door and have no repercussions to what I say. Um, no, look, I mean, as I, as I said yesterday, Europe is deeply divided over not just what Europe is, whether it's liberal Europe or conservative Europe, but it's divided uh, over this question of immigration and identity. The debate in Europe isn't so much, does Europe want or need immigration? It's more what type of immigration? And unfortunately, much of the debate presents this in a, in a binary um, a political way, which is you're either for open borders or you are against open borders. Uh, what is clear, certainly um, in much of Western Europe, is that people want high-skill migration, uh, migration that contributes to the economy and society, but also, ideally, what Europeans would consider to be culturally compatible forms of migration. And so when we talk about the demographic shifts from Northern Africa, from the Middle East, from Syria, and so on, we are talking about the exact kind of migration that makes uh, majorities of electorates in Europe feel profoundly uncomfortable and under threat. So when the British uh, effectively stood up in 2016 and said they didn't think the European Union can competently manage the refugee crisis, and it at that point wasn't, and you might argue still isn't, um, they said effectively they wanted stronger borders and they wanted greater control over migration. Now the response to that has been to say, well, the Brits are stupid, the Brits didn't know what they wanted, or as we heard earlier on, Brexit's going to be an unmitigated disaster. All they effectively said through that vote was that they wanted greater control over who goes into their country and who leaves their country. And it's a very difficult request for some to handle for political reasons, but it's a fairly straightforward uh, request for an electorate to make. The only last point that I will say on this as well is that Let's see where we are a year from now. When you guys come back for this conference in 2019, let's see how the Brexit debate is evolving. Here's my prediction, and you, won't, you might not see me next year, so you can't laugh at me if I'm wrong. <laughs> my prediction is we'll be quickly on our way to a bespoke free trade agreement with the European Union, that the British economy will be growing as it is now, one, one and a half percent. We'll probably be lagging behind some advanced Western democracies uh, and economies, but it won't be a disaster. Most of the economic forecasts that came up in 2016, which were promoted vigorously by parts of the media, turned out to be wildly inaccurate. And I never really quote Yanis Varoufakis, the former Greek minister, often, but I will quote him today when he said that economic forecasts are a bit like sausages. Uh, once you've seen how they're made, you don't want to go near them. 
And all of those forecasts were wildly inaccurate. Right now, we're supposed to be in a recession with 450,000 unemployed. Instead, we have the highest employment rates for 40 years, and we're growing at about 1.8%, much in excess of the IMF forecast. The French and the Germans would love to see this be an unmitigated disaster, but it won't be. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Avril, I think you had something to say. Sure. I just, um, I think immigration is a global issue and not just an EU issue or a US issue and across the board. And I think one of the things that, you know, I'm struck by is maybe if you separate out the public conversation to just go to the policy wonk conversation for a moment and think about, you know, 65 million displaced people around the world, right, over 20 million refugees around the world. And the United States, for example, has the largest refugee program in the world. And when we were doing it, 110,000 was the maximum that we had gotten to in 2017. And that's a drop in the bucket when you consider the numbers that I've just described to you, right? So there's an enormous problem that needs to be addressed. And one of the issues is creating sort of legal channels in countries for actually providing for a refugee. There are a number of countries around the world that don't have a refugee program at all, and ones that are just starting in very small numbers, and that needs to change over time. Another one is dealing with the human trafficking aspect of this, which is enormous, and there's a multi-billion dollar market in that context. Mm -hmm. Another is thinking through helping other countries develop border security that actually makes sense, so you do have the legal channels, but you also cut off the illegal channels. Another piece is completely reforming the humanitarian structure, which a number of folks have been working on very heavily, because part of the problem with refugees and immigration flows is that, frankly, you end up putting all of your humanitarian money on the urgent crisis, and you stop planning for the long-term resilience that you need to do. Another piece of it is helping countries of first asylum, countries like Turkey and Lebanon and Jordan deal with the problem when they've got millions coming in through their borders and they have to deal with it as an initial piece. It, it's, a lot of it is also dealing with countries in Africa that are also countries of first asylum that are managing it like Kenya. So it's a, an enormous problem. And then when you put this piece to one side, right, and then you talk about the perception of immigration, what you see is how detached sometimes the public conversation is from the reality. And just as an example of this issue, from my perspective at least, we've had a debate in this country about the refugee program. And there's been a, a concern raised, including by the current administration, about security issues related to the refugee program in particular. And it, to my mind, that is one piece of this that seems totally disconnected from reality in the sense that refugees go through the most vetting of any traveler to the United States, you know, as opposed to, for example, people who come in on a visa or don't have to require a visa or other things like that. And when you look at the facts for the refugee program, what you see is an incredibly tiny percentage, right, of even being convicted ultimately of any kind of crime in that scenario. Nobody's actually killed anybody in the United States came through the refugee program in that scenario. So it's, it, it is one of these things where we have to actually figure out how to have a nuanced, intelligent conversation about immigration, because I'm not saying that any immigration doesn't present a security problem. I think Matthew's exactly right that there are there are real issues and ones that need to be addressed, and countries have to raise those concerns in a serious way. But w the conversation that's happening is not actually connected to the facts, in my view, in a significant way. And that's something that has to change. A quick yeah, point. Yeah, very, yeah, very, yeah. very quickly, actually, to, to reinforce and, and build on Errol's point, we are getting a lot of immigration in Canada from the EU. We're getting a lot of French uh, people showing up in Quebec and saying we're not so happy with how it's going. Yeah. And oh, by the way, you speak French, sort of, so we'd like to move here. <laughs> um, and, uh, and we're also getting a lot of people walking across our border. I don't know if you saw this last winter, we had thousands of people just walk across this northern, the, your northern border, our southern border. 
and we had to uh, transform the Olympic Stadium into a refugee center to process them. So for our for this issue of you know trying to figure out whether to our clarify citizens, these aren't American these aren't United States citizens taking refuge in Canada these are refugees who've come to the United States and are choosing to on on pass to Canada based on the number of people in Camden who've asked me how they can move to Canada well that's a separate question <laughs> but the ones who were in the stadium that you're referring to are are from other countries yeah I mean we US. haven't built a wall yet but that's just because we can't figure out how Mexico will pay for it <laughs> Jerry so, uh, I would just add two interesting side notes about the American perspective here which I think run counter to conventional wisdom. In our polling, we have consistently found through 2016 and 2017 into this year two things. One is that a, a, a plurality of Americans continue to think that immigration is good for the country, not bad for the country. More think it's good for the country than think it's bad for the country. And second, among Trump voters, immigration and the wall actually fall very low down on their list mm. of priorities. Now, mm. there's a lot of juice, there's a lot of ele political electricity in those topics, but in fact, even Trump voters tend to be worried more about other things than immigration and the wall. Uh, name name the cup like the top the job lost thing. job lost overseas top issue far and away mm -hmm. um, and trade is a, is a huge issue because it's a subset of that those issues even for Trump voters are far more important at least in terms of the way they responded to our polling than our immigration and building a wall okay all right good and we're gonna try to speed it up so we get more questions in and I believe that we have another question from one of our remote locations what advice would you give to a college student who wants to become a foreign service officer? Asked Lexi Bartlett in Portland. Well, I have to say, Lexi, let me just speak straight to Lexi because we have seen such a decrease in the number of people taking the foreign service exam, um, ambassadors, people of sort of ambassador level. I think it's people equivalent to two-star and three-star generals, something like 60% of them. I have this number in some of my columns that I've written about the depletion of the State Department in the last year. Um, so I'll refer you to that because I can't remember the exact numbers. But I have to throw this question first to Chaz Freeman, who's been a career foreign service uh, person in the State Department. Oh, and who told me this morning that he started his foreign service career in my father's hometown of Madras. Indeed. <laughs> Indeed. Um, not called Chennai then. Yeah, that's that right. Was, uh, made up. Um, so I would, uh, I would answer that question this way. Um, do you want to make a difference? Uh, is that what you're interested in? Do you want to serve your country? If so, when your country is in trouble, it needs you most, and you can make the greatest difference. I was saying earlier to Jerry, I have a personal hero who is Belisarius. He was a Bulgar drafted by Byzantine Empire, a great general and statesman, invented many of the elements of modern foreign office and espionage, um, as well as, uh, and he gave Byzantium 400 years, which it didn't deserve, frankly, um, and paid the price. Uh, uh, the Emperor Justinian eventually um, did him in because um, he outshone the Emperor. <clears throat> but this is, Belisarius' perspective was the Empire is in deep trouble. Um, this is the moment when I can be of most utility. And it's my duty to do that. So if you have any, if that has any resonance with you, Leslie, then this is, this is your moment. We're going through a bad patch. Uh, I'll, I'll just make one final uh, comment. The Department of State, which is being uh, very savage, essentially, um, is different from the Foreign Service. It's a different institution. The Foreign Service um, is the diplomatic service, the Department of State as many domestic uh, functions or functions that bridge domestic and foreign affairs. Uh, it's in Washington. Uh, the Foreign Service serves all over the world. If you think you have the capacity to help foreigners learn to do things the way we want them to do them and persuade them that it's in their interest to do things that we want them to do them, then diplomacy is where you ought to be, and the Foreign Service is where you can do that. Um, it can be a splendid career. 
You can be a spear carrier on the stage. Sometimes you get to sing an aria. Um, and uh, you could be part of history if things work out that way. Worked out Well, that's me. pretty inspiring. Lexi, I hope you do well on your foreign service exam. <laughs> After that, Steve wanted to add something. I, two very quick points. If you're, I, I agree with everything Chess just said. I would add two, uh, two other points. One is if you are headed in that direction, the more uh, of world history that you can master mm -hmm. while you have the opportunity, the better, because that is the body of knowledge that will allow you to understand both America's place in the world, but also, very importantly, how other societies see the world, the narratives they tell themselves the way they view the last 200, 300, 500 or, or more years, and that's absolutely critical to any kind of successful diplomacy. The second point I would make is because those institutions are now being systematically damaged, the great irony or paradox is this is in fact an opportunity that for people who go in now, the, many of those upper and medium ranks are going to be empty, and the ability of talented people to move in and rebuild these institutions when they need to be rebuilt, which is inevitable, it's going to have to happen. Uh, so in, in an odd way, and I'm sorry to say this, this is sort of a unique opportunity where we need such people, but where also they may have chances to advance very rapidly. Right on. Well, that's a great piece of advice from someone who trains a lot of future Foreign Service officers at the Kennedy School. Um, I know that Matthew and Avril are going to need to go, but did you want to add something, Matthew, since you also train, I think, some future uh, British Foreign Service officers, I imagine, at Chatham House. You probably engage with them anyway. Um, I would say, why don't you want to be an academic? <laughs> Brilliant. You get to travel the world. You get to come to great places like this. Um, but no, unfortunately, we do have to go. And I just wanted to take the opportunity to thank um, uh, the organisers and, and thank my hosts, um, uh, uh, Ward and Tracy, for, for uh, all of your hospitality. And I'm going back to a little island saying great things about Camden. Uh, <laughs> so thank you very much. And Avril, did you want to add anything to, uh, to advice since you also have worked with so many diplomats in your career, your long career in Washington? Sure. No, I just encourage all of you to consider this that are students and that are thinking about a job. It is one of the most rewarding, extraordinary experiences to work for the government and represent your country in any variety of ways. And I fully endorse what's been said about this issue. But I'd also consider the CIA and other parts of the U.S. government, and I think you should. It's, um, there's so many places where you can make a difference in so many extraordinary ways. And if you don't think that everything that's happening is right and that uh, you, know, you would do it differently, then get involved and actually make a difference in that respect. I really appreciate I so much enjoyed meeting many of the students that said that they might be interested in this field, and I hope that you will pursue that and that you look to all of us who have been in government before to help you in that way, because it's our responsibility to do that as well. Thank you so much. Really Thank you, April and Matthew. <laughs> All right, well, they were, they were fantastic, but we still have other fantastic people on stage. So let's continue with our conversation. We have a question here. Tony Grassi from Camden. Um, I have a question from Ambassador Freeman. The title of your talk was This Too Shall Pass. I didn't hear what's going to make it pass. And <laughs> how about a little optimistic explanation of how you get from what you said to... Ch Chaz, wasn't it partly about you saying that there is someone out there, people like these students, who are eventually going to be the ones who know how to lead us in a better direction? Uh, that's part of the meaning. The other is that we have to recognize, as I said, that periods of disorganization are followed by organization. Disorder dissolves into order. Um, and that's going to happen. Whether we uh, take an active role in shaping the future or not, uh, I think we face a choice. We can, we can sit back and let things drift, and uh, something will come, come up, and and then we'll just have to learn to live with that. Uh, or I think we can take a more active role, which I strongly favor. And at the end of my talk, I gave a list of issues: raise savings rate, improve education, invest in infrastructure, change labor management relations, uh, work on on liberating economic activity from the fetters of the tax code and local regulation, 
and so forth. Um, I think if you ask experts on these issues, um, on a particular issue, they'll agree with that. But nobody's putting it all together. And what we need is an integrated approach. And I know there are people out there uh, who are not megalomaniacs, so they're not already running for president, um, but um, who are serious and intelligent and capable and have leadership skills. Um, and I think we need to encourage those people and support them as they step forward, uh, because they will. I'm, I'm confident. I'm optimistic. All right. Let's go to an. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear what you said. <laughs> I don't know if he was thinking of anyone the, the, in particular. The names are for you to discover. Uh, That's right. All right. Um, let's go to another question here. Jim Matlack from Rockport. Again, thank you all for the uh, contributions you've made to an extraordinary conference. In the broad sweep of our discussion of world disorder, there's a long-running conflict that hasn't been given any particular attention, and I want to just briefly turn to it. That's the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Uh, it seems almost submerged now in the region in terms of attention. Syria, Yemen, Iran, et cetera, takes prominent place. The Trump administration has simply broken with decades of the international framework within which this issue has attempted to be dealt with, with their Jerusalem decision. I have a wide range of Palestinian friends who have spent their lives working nonviolently for recognition of Palestinian rights. So, sir, what is the question? I wonder what thoughts Stephen Walt and Chaz Freeman in particular have on whether those advocates have any plausible future left Thank at all. Thank you very much. Okay, Steve, you take yeah. it first. I'll be very brief about this. I, I believe the international framework that you described, which was basically the framework coming out of the Oslo Accords, where Israel and the Palestinian Authority would eventually negotiate a two-state solution, uh, has failed. Uh, and it failed in part because of errors made by uh, the Palestinians. It failed in part because of the policy of the Israeli government, which I think was never actually all that interested in a genuine two-state solution. And it failed because three successive American presidents, Bill Clinton, George W. Bush, and Barack Obama, mismanaged that diplomacy rather badly. We did not serve as an even-handed mediator. The result of that is that the two-state solution that had been the official policy or goal of the U.S. government, I think, is now essentially uh, dead. Uh, you can imagine ways it might get resurrected, but I think that's very unlikely. And as uh, the former Israeli Prime Minister Ehud Olmert warned back in 2007 in an interview where he said, well, if the two-state solution fails, Israel will face a South Africa-like struggle for political rights. And then he added, and if that happens, the state of Israel is finished. That's not me. That's Ehud Olmert speaking. Now, I don't know if that's actually going to happen. I don't think, in fact, that the state of Israel is in that much trouble in the, in the near term as well. But I do think what you're going to see over time is the Palestinians moving away from the goal of statehood, uh, which would, I think, have been the best outcome there, and moving back towards saying, well, if Israel wants to control all of this land and the people within it, then all of the people within it ought to have equal political rights. That is not a panacea. That is not a uh, romantic outcome because it's going to be a very bitter struggle. The outcome may not be a particularly viable state, given the history there. Binational states do not have a great track record historically, et cetera. And I regard this as a, a tragic outcome for Israelis, Palestinians, and all those who care about them, because we're getting an outcome that's not going to be as good as we might have had with a little bit more farsighted diplomacy. I say that with no pleasure at all, by the way. Um, so the gentleman also wanted to hear from Chaz, and I know that um, Cleo has something quick to say as well. <laughs> Um, I agree with uh, uh, most of what Steve said. I just point out a few things. Um, um, I think uh, uh, Palestinians now face a very difficult choice. Uh, they can attempt peacefully, which has been their mode uh, almost exclusively, despite all the attention that violence gets. Uh, they can attempt peacefully to agitate for equal rights under the State of Israel. 
The State of Israel governs four different kinds of people. Israeli Jews who have full citizen rights and citizenship rights and are participants in Israel's democracy on a complete basis. Uh, Israeli Arabs, Paris, Palestinian Israelis, who are second-class citizens, uh, treated much like minorities were uh, in an earlier era in the United States. Um, Palestinians who are in the West Bank occupied, who have no rights, no franchise, no vote, no say in their future, and who are managed by the Palestinian Authority, which is uh, in effect a subcontractor uh, to Israel in the United States, headed by Mahmoud Abbas. Um, and Gaza, which is an open air prison into which Israel periodically lofts uh, bombs and artillery shells. Um, so this isn't a sustainable situation. By, even if you discount external factors, it's a very bad bet to try to continue on this path. Um, external factors cannot be discounted. Although Israel basically is uh, militarily invulnerable to any of its uh, neighbors, it's vastly superior. It doesn't face a military threat. What Israel faces is an internal threat, and not just from the Palestinians. There are an increasing number of Israelis of conscience who are deeply troubled by the situation I just described. Uh, we're getting the benefit of their troubled uh, dispositions as we welcome them to New York and Los Angeles and Florida and other places. Um, last point, it is not the case that there is no external threat to Israel in the long run. Um, the phenomenon of Daesh, the Islamic Caliphate, Al-Qaeda, other Islamic uh, protest and resistance and terrorist movements um, is there and it's extending into the Palestinian uh, region as well. And you could imagine Israel becoming the principal focus of these, uh, these forces, uh, which it hasn't been. Uh, and that would be very, very hard for uh, Israel to deal with. It certainly would result in a further curtailment of already curtailed democratic rights among the Jewish Israeli population. Uh, so the danger to Israel is not that it goes out with a bang, but it goes out with a whimper as it deflates, as the best people leave, as people join the Israeli colony in Berlin, of all places, um, because uh, they feel safer and more able to fulfill uh, their, their, their personal promise there. Uh, the United States has sidelined ourselves completely. We have no influence on this. The Palestinians who had recognized the state of Israel are now threatening to uh, end their recognition of Israel. Uh, they won't talk to us. Vice President Pence was there and uh, they, will not, they do not consider us anything uh, other than a, a stooge for Israel. Uh, and uh, they're looking for Chinese, Russian, European, other partners to help them in uh, overcome their weakness in bargaining with the Israelis. The Israelis show no interest in bargaining with them. Okay, thank you. And then briefly to Cleo, our geostrategic expert, and briefly to Jerry, a former Mideast correspondent, because we want to be able to get to more questions, I, too. I know, I'll be brief. I know how it works. Um, we, uh, at the Sraicina Dialogue, if you remember, I put up the picture of the quad there. The, the keynote speaker was Netanyahu. He was uh, visiting India last month. He was treated like a rock star. And it's worth, again, bringing in this issue that was brought up above of uh, broadening the scope of looking at who the major players are. The India-Israel defense and security cooperation is growing, especially since the Mumbai bombings where uh, uh, Jews in Mumbai were targeted. And it, w it was deeply affecting the Indian security community. They didn't like that. Um, and also in areas like irrigation, medicine, those sorts of things. Modi was the first uh, Indian prime minister to visit Israel in the 3,000 years of Indian history, as Netanyahu puts it, uh, sort of Israeli history. Um, uh, but he then 
just a couple of weeks ago, went back and visited Gaza alone, where he announced that India would be building a hospital and some educational facilities. So other players are getting involved in different ways for their own reasons that may be making the situation um, a, a little bit more nuanced, and it's worth considering when we're doing the analysis. Jerry. So quick thought. The, I think the Palestinians' biggest problem is the way their issue has simply receded from international prominence. Um, the most important thing that happened when President Trump announced that the embassy would be moving to Jerusalem was what didn't happen. There was no Arab outcry. There was no rise uh, up in the Arab street. There was very little protest. The Palestinians must at that point have felt fairly abandoned. That is not what the reaction would have been 20 years ago when, when I was in the Middle East. Um, secondly, these Israeli simply don't worry that much about the Palestinian problem as a threat to them or their mm -hmm. stability. They spend almost all their time worrying about the nuclear threat from Iran. They have simply, like everybody else, moved their gaze elsewhere. All right. Um, we have got a question here in the balcony. Uh, hello. Hank there, Weathersfield, Connecticut. Question for the, the panel. Um, so I change a, a focus back to instability in general. Uh, the question is, rather than the start of a short or perhaps extended anomalous period of instability, might the world be essentially returning to its normal state of chaos after a brief anomalous period of stability <laughs> following World War II? That's an interesting question. <laughs> That is an interesting question. So are we looking at it the wrong way around? When we say new world disorder, is it really that it's always been disorder and we had a brief few hundred years or whatever-ish of civilization marked by world wars in the last century? Um, Steve, would you like to tackle that one first? Yeah. That's a great question, and, and I think there's actually a lot to be said for it, right? you know, given sort of my view of, of the world, where I see the world largely, not entirely, but largely in terms of contending major powers. Right. That is the record, you know, going back many centuries, uh, certainly in Europe, but also in other, other parts of the world as well. And this, we have had this unusual period, the period that... Um, uh, John Lewis Gaddis, historian at Yale, called you know the long peace, right? We used to call it the Cold War, but the Cold War was also, in an interesting way, the long peace among major powers. Lots of trouble in other parts of the world, and some of that fueled by great power rivalry, of course, but uh, generally tranquil. And as Chaz uh, laid out uh, this morning, that was also based, at least in the West, on the building of a lot of these uh, institutions that helped smooth the interactions between contending powers even when they disagreed. Um, that was, I think, an unusual period. It was fueled in part by American dominance. It was fueled in part by America being rather far-sighted in generating some of those institutions. And if the United States is now becoming relatively less dominant, not weak, but relatively less dominant, and as we've already heard, other powers are beginning to re-emerge with interests of their own, historical perspectives of their own, assets uh, of their own, I think, yes, we are sort of reverting back to what has been a more familiar condition of world politics. And as I tried to say in my remarks on Friday, that's not what we were expecting in 93, 94, when we thought we had essentially established what the blueprint was for everybody worldwide, and everyone was going to gradually converge onto our way of doing business. I think we are going to have to start relearning how to interact in a world where others do not necessarily want to follow uh, everything that we believe in, or we have to work much harder at persuading them that our way of doing business is actually in their interest as well as ours. Remember in that same period, Francis Fukuyama's end of history was all the rage, and I think that he's in some ways maybe taken that back a little he, bit. He, he, has, uh, <laughs> he has recanted to yes. a large extent. I was trying to be polite. All right, before I go to the next question over here, I'd like to remind you all that if you're in the Opera House and you want to ask a question, you need to get the attention of one of the people with the microphones and the cards. All right, over here, sir. Uh, Fred Coulon from Rockport, Maine. Uh, a definition of leadership, and we, we have discussed leadership here, but we haven't really defined it. Uh, a definition that appeals to me uh, is a person of competence who stands in that lonely place between what is and what might be. Now, do we, uh, does the panel see 
leaders in the world that fit that definition. That's a great today. question. Thank you so much, sir. And I'm going to turn that first over to Natalie, because um, I want to ask you, I thought that uh, Matthew illustrated it really well. I think it, was, I think it was he with the big image of The Economist cover that showed Macron in the spotlight and Angela Merkel kind of in the shadow. And the implication was these are the ones who are going to save us. So you tell us, are Macron and Angela Merkel going to save the world? <laughs> <coughs> Short answer, no. But um, but I do think that I do think that um, both um, have leadership qualities that are that are that are there. I mean, I think Angela Merkel showed leadership on on uh, European uh, very important European issues. Germany's policies weren't perfect uh, by all means, but she showed she showed leadership and she kept a lot of the, the show on the road. Um, over these last very rocky years. Macron has also leadership qualities because he has, he has a vision. Now, uh, who, who said that anybody who has a vision uh, should go and see a doctor? But, um, <laughs> but, but he does have a vision, and I think that is needed uh, in, in, that is very much needed, you know, as a, leader, as a quality of leadership, the capacity to first have a vision and then express it and try to bring people behind it. It doesn't mean your resources are instantly transformed. You know, France is not a, a superpower at all. Uh, so your resources are what they are. But if you can at least send an impulse that, that kind of tries to contain some of the bad stuff that's going on and try to contain those nationalist, populist uh, instincts that are creeping up, uh, I, think, I think personalities do count and some people do have leadership qualities. Thea, I want to turn the question to you because you're the one overtly progressive voice on the panel who has been critiquing the sort of neoliberal leadership that we've had in the last decades, um, not only in the US, in Europe as well. So you tell us this man has defined his qualities that he sees as leadership. Who do you see as a leader who fits your vision for what we should be doing? Well, there's no, there's no one perfect person, but I do think that Bernie Sanders dis displayed a lot of leadership in the last presidential campaign. He, he <clears throat> stands for something that he stood for his entire life uh, in a lo somewhat lonely place, but he wasn't lonely by the end of that campaign. And, you know, it was a principled position in terms of health care and access to education and good jobs and workers' rights. And those were things that he has always demonstrated. And that's why I guess I took so much offense at lumping him in the same category as Donald Trump, who you know, I think has displayed a lot of hypocrisy and has never, you know, lived up to anything that he, um, he stood for. But so, Thea, in terms yeah. of just, leaders I, who might just, actually... Can I, can I just be clear? I did not lump Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump. <laughs> I said the populist movements that fuel both of them had some similar roots. It's not the same thing. Okay. Yeah, the leaders were not defined as the same. So, but, but, but since we, nobody thinks that Bernie Sanders is going to run again right. in 2020, why don't you talk about who you see as having those leadership qualities who might actually be a, a leader in the future? Well, I think Elizabeth Warren has a wonderful voice, a wonderful strong voice that um, is fearless. And she is the fearless woman, um, and I would love to see her run. I think, um, you know, we see Kamala Harris has been uh, very strong in the Senate. She's very new, I think not maybe experienced enough at this particular point, but it's good to see, you know, younger and fresher voices out there as well. But um, I do think that Elizabeth Warren on issues like trade and banking and workers' rights and equality has been a tremendously um, articulate and powerful and principled voice. So I, I like Okay. Her. Uh, thank you. Chaz, you had a brief thought to, to add? Uh, well, there are lots of leaders who have admirable qualities. Um, for example, Mr. Erdogan, but he's off his meds. Now, um, <laughs> um, <laughs> Xi Jinping, but he's a control freak. We're talking about leadership in the United States. One thing that needs to be mentioned in that context is uh, the president is the manager of the largest single organization uh, that we have, the federal government. Um, he is the commander in chief of the military, or he or she uh, is the inspiration for the country and should be capable of using the presidency as a pulpit from which to raise rather than lower um, public understanding of issues. Um, these qualities are learned. Uh, they're not 
evident in members of the Senate who have nothing to manage but a small staff. Um, and I think as we look for future leadership, uh, we need to get out of this business of saying that because somebody's a celebrity and we think they're nice, um, you know, they run a good TV show, they're Donald Trump, they're op Oprah Winfrey, they're somebody, you know, that, that's the sort of person we want as president. No. We want somebody, to use your word, sir, competent. Uh, <laughs> All right. So, um, so let's go to a question from one of our satellite locations. David Wiegand in Portland asks, how will climate change impact American foreign policy? Cleo, over to you. <laughs> uh, well, it depends on what you mean by climate change. So if, if what you mean is uh, impacts, so um, we're, we're likely to see more dislocation, more problems, all that sort of stuff globally because the systems, because we built into the environment that was there and assumed that it would never change. So our physical infrastructure is built on an unstable base and our legal infrastructure is built on an unstable base because it also assumes that the environment that it governs won't change. So if you look at the Nile, for example, the water sharing agreements on the Nile are based on, to be, to be completely wrong and very simplistic, uh, it assumes that there's 100 liters, 100 gallons of water in the Nile, and that Egypt gets 80 and Sudan gets 20. That assumes there'll always be 100. Well, if there goes to 80, 80 gallons in the Nile, suddenly you have a problem immediately. And many of our treaties and legal structures are designed assuming the physical environment is static. So there will be an increasing set of problems as a result. Now the question is, are, is the US gonna be proactive and try to uh, head off those completely unnecessary problems in many cases beforehand? Or will it uh, have to respond on an ad hoc basis? You're starting to see a lot more uh, had her, uh, humanitarian assistance and disaster uh, response activities. Often that's used as a, um, not a, okay, a cover for uh, deployment into certain regions, especially in the Asia Pacific. So in some cases, it can be useful for um, expanding into a region in what seems like a non-aggressive fashion. Um, it would be preferable over the long term that it gets incorporated and it has no effect on foreign policy. Um, but if it's not incorporated, then it, it potentially will have a very big effect as our allies are affected uh, and, and, in fact, our adversaries are affected and try to take advantage of the dislocation and disruption in order to undermine the West's position. All right. I know we have other questions waiting, but Chaz wanted to make a brief interjection. Um, we have environmental refugees already. Um, there are a lot of people in China who are sending their kids here because they don't like the pollution in Chinese cities. Um, that is a harbinger of the future. If significant parts of the Arabian Peninsula become uninhabitable because the heat, the level of heat is above that that the human body can sustain, which is expected in Kuwait and in some other significant areas, uh, there will be refugees. Uh, those refugees will probably have a lot of money. The ones who are in danger of drowning as Bangladesh goes under the sea uh, will not have a lot of money. Uh, and the scenes that we see now between Myanmar and, and uh, Bangladesh with the Rohingya are something we're going to see a lot more of. And they are very, very destabilizing. Uh, and they will inevitably involve every great power, including the United States. OK. We have, we're going to go to another question from one of the remote locations. If liberal democracy is in decline, what is likely to take its place? Asks Eric Squire of Portland. I asked this very question of Steve Walt for a column last year. So I'm going to start with you, Steve, <laughs> what to did, renew what your did answer. I say? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to have to Google that and get back to you. But I did ask you this question. <laughs> um, well, again, I guess I don't think that there's going to be a sort of one-size-fits-all response here. Uh, first of all, you don't want to rule out the possibility that, uh, in fact, what we've seen is a bad patch for liberal democracy, both here and in other places, but that uh, precisely the sense that we're in danger of losing that which we value uh, the most about our polity, in fact, galvanizes more people and things begin to turn around the other way. I think that's been the wish of almost all the speakers here in a, in a variety of different ways. 
And so you may, in fact, see democratic renewal here in the United States. Certainly, you're seeing lots of things happen within the United States in various ways that are encouraging. And I think you see that in some other places as well. So you can't rule out the possibility that things will swing back in a more positive direction. If they do not, I think it's going to depend uh, in different places. Uh, so we are seeing in, in parts of Eastern Europe uh, this emergence of you know what Orban in Hungary calls illiberal democracy. And I, I don't easily imagine how that pendulum swings back anytime uh, uh, soon. I think what has happened in Turkey, where many of us had hopes that the AKP was going to lead Turkey into a, a really sort of long period of stable, prosperous, and increasingly uh, liberal democracy, is heading the wrong direction. I don't see that swinging back. So I guess my bottom line is that, that if democracy collapses in various places, it's going to collapse in slightly different ways in each of these places, uh, depending on the particular circumstances there. Uh, you know, it's uh, this is where you would quote normally quote Chekhov, right? Every unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. <laughs> Every democracy that collapses will collapse in a slightly <clears throat> different blueprint, and I, I just hope we don't get a lot of examples. I think it was Tolstoy. Sorry to correct oh, you. Sorry, you're All right, right. Natalie. You're absolutely right. <laughs> Natalie, um, since you are actually across the pond and a lot closer to Poland and Hungary, and and many of the trends that Matthew was showing us in his presentation yesterday, do you think that the liberal world order and liberal democracy is in decline from your vantage point in Europe. Do you see something else more authoritarian filling its place? One of the things that's worried me, um, and, and I'm sure some of you have seen this, is, is it was one study by, uh, I think, a Harvard professor, Yasha Monk, who showed that mm -hmm. last year that millennials across mm -hmm. um, Western democracies, millennials are uh, much weaker defenders of uh, liberal democracy than we would hope they would be. Um, and it's the older generation, people who've experienced, um, who have a memory of the 20th century, who, and, and there's a very clear uh, uh, graphic that shows this uh, generational uh, difference. And, and that, is, that is worrying. That, that, that worries me, you know, the, the fact that younger generations may not care so much or may be even attracted towards the notion of a strong man or, and this is happening in Europe, but it's also happening, it's, it's been observed in the U.S. as well. So I think that's the most worrying uh, trend. And briefly, because we always, want to get to one more always, question. Always, I promise. No, uh, just, uh, we haven't talked about Africa at all. Uh, much, anyway, and uh, there's very promising signs in Africa. If you look towards the future, Liberia just had an election where there was a perfectly fine transfer of power. Mugabe's finally gone. You know, it may take a while. There's Zuma's out. You know, it may take a while, but there are a lot of parts of the world which we haven't really looked at where there are more promising signs. Okay, good. We have a question down here. Uh, yes, Bruce Cole from Rockport. Maine. Taking the president's yes. privilege. <laughs> Taking the <laughs> I didn't president's it was you. privilege. Uh, I just, this is a question for uh, Cleo Pascal. Um, I'll be brief. Uh, okay, okay. <laughs> I, I understand. Uh, I, I, I really liked and appreciated your explanation and your treatment of the three geos, and this is a, uh, about the geophysical part. I think you referenced sea level change, you showed us the flooded airports, you referenced water availability and uh, uh, food availability, you know, and some of the um, uh, geophysical changes that may bring additional pressure. I, I just want to ask, as you look at the data and can look as far as you can into the future of 20, 50 years, what are the trends and is the world even within a cannon shot of addressing these trends? Thank you. Yeah, uh, thanks. No. No, we're not. Um, uh, and and again, again it, it has to do, I mean, was that brief enough? I was going to say, that's super brief. <laughs> yeah. too, too brief. Okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad you're not saying too short, because that's what people usually say when they make Oh, but I'm bummed. Um, uh, yeah, it, we're not just because it isn't a, a box that's been put on our checklist. This isn't existential and it isn't something that we not, can't necessarily handle. It's just something that we haven't built into our systems to incorporate into our insurance sector, our zoning regulations, you know, very nitty gritty, boring stuff that anybody who's on the Kempton City Council should incorporate or probably does incorporate into the decision making process. Because this isn't one problem, this is a billion little problems. 
and they need to be handled piece by piece. Even if we had signed on to Paris and everybody did what they were supposed to do, as you saw with the hurricane track map, map this is embedded into our systems. We need to use our US Army, your US Army Corps of Engineers in a way that increases resilience and doesn't undermine stability like happened in New Orleans. We need to get rid of the National Flood Insurance Program. We need to um, stop making those costs externalities in decision making and do actual risk-based economics in decision making. And once we sort of start to incorporate it into all of those processes, we'll be able to handle it. So the first step is just to acknowledge that this is, this is a risk. We know it's a risk. Uh, in Africa, they're doing uh, micro insurance for farming. That's been very helpful with resilience. There are lots of solutions out there, best practices globally. But if we can start to incorporate it into understanding that, yeah, geopolitics is changing, geoeconomics is changing, but also the physical environment is changing, we incorporate it into decision making, we can move forward uh, in a much more secure way. Thank you. All right. If you can make your question brief, then we have time for one last question. Uh, Ron Bankra from Cumberland. So I've seen a lot of elections um, over the years, and I always felt that wherever we were in the country at the time when the body politic actually went into the ballot box, that they would make a good sound decision. And I, I just am profoundly put back by the last election. And I wonder if, I hate to say this, but have American voters, I mean the ones who vote, have we gotten so lazy and so easily ill-informed that we are not carrying through the values that we all grew up with. Thank you so much for your question. And Jerry, I have to pass it to you first because you're so close to the Wall Street Journal poll, which looks at American voters, their preferences and their trends. Over decades now, you've been looking at that. So please tell us. Well, look, I, I think it's a great question. I go back to, I think, something Chaz said, which is you have to start with the 40% of Americans who don't vote, right? So uh, what what is it um, about democracy in America that prompts that many people to check out. And I think if they check back in, you might have a different picture. If you look at the people who didn't vote in 2016, they're the most important people, I would argue, in some ways, not the people who did vote, because the outcome would have been different. So that's, I think, the first thing to keep in mind. The second thing, I think, it is if you look at elections over time, particularly presidential elections, most of them are a reaction to the previous election. And um, so there is a way, a strange way in which democracy is self-correcting, you know, that seems to go off toward the, the hitting the banks and then it sort of moves back toward the center. And I think if, in the end, you simply have to have faith in democracy and in the American people. Um, you know, there was a, a bit of an experiment in 2016. If people don't like it, I think you have to have faith that the system and <coughs> they themselves have the power to adjust. Thea, you would like to add something? Yeah, I did want to jump right in because I think it's a great question. And I wouldn't blame, I I'm not going to blame all Americans, but I do think our, we have allowed our system to become uh, you know, less effective. And I would say campaign finance reform is something that everybody should be working on and working for. To the extent that we allow money to dominate our elections, it's either rich people who run for, for, for office, and almost everybody in the House and the Senate now is a rich person, or they are beholden to rich people in corporations, and that can't possibly be you know, what we want from our democracy. But I also think that the, you know, the two big parties became complacent and were run too much in a top-down way, and that's why I am encouraged by all the energy that we're seeing out there. To, uh, you know, Emily's List has tens of thousands of people signing up to run for office at every level of, of government, you know, not just the big you know, governor and senator and House of Representatives, but state legislature and city council and dog catcher. And I think that's exactly what people need to do. It's the, how you get engaged. It's how you learn. And so I, I hope that that, that energy will, will last through 18 and through 20, but, um, but also um, in the sense that Oh, I, the other thing I was going to say is that part of what we've seen, the turbulence in American elections, is that we've had a lot, because of the underlying failed economy that I talked about yesterday, we've come into a lot of elections with people just wanting a change. I think 08 was a change election, 16 was a change election, and sometimes they didn't get the change they exactly were, were hoping for. But uh, until our politicians, so not just the candidates, but the politicians can start to deliver better outcomes in terms of an economy that works for everybody, that delivers shared prosperity, that takes care of the little person, 
um, then uh, there's going to be a lot of anger out there, and sometimes that anger is misdirected. And I would just, if I could just add, I totally agree. I think that 2016 ushered in an age of new voter activism, and you're seeing it all over. Those of us who have kids who are millennials are seeing it up front. I think that this is a new phase. I think that an inflection point was 2016, and we have a, an era of voter activism now that has begun, and I don't know what the exact consequences of that are, but it's going to be different. We saw that in Virginia. Steve, quick thought? Hmm. No? Chaz, you're the last American on the panel. Would you like to take us out with some <laughs> final thoughts? We had a, we had a Brexit, all right. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to ignore the Canadian and the French, but since this is a question about American elections, Chaz? Died um, I agree with a lot of the despair in your question. Um, and I hope um, Jerry and Thea are right and that we are seeing an inflection point. But I go back to the thought that what happens in this country is ultimately decided by us. Uh, and if we can't have an informed debate because we don't have access to information uh, but only disinformation, uh, we have a problem. We have some institutional problems in this country we need to fix. Uh, looking ahead, uh, but I'm encouraged by what Jerry and Thea said. I, I, I would like to highlight your point about how we need access to, to reliable information and not disinformation, and this is where I put in my pitch that we need all of you as engaged American citizens to pay for reliable news, and that means not just reading it online for free, but subscribing, whether you're subscribing to a home subscription, subscribing online. Uh, you can't read Jerry Seib's stuff unless you pay for it, because the Wall Street Journal is behind a paywall, and, and you can't read my articles more than five a month because it's behind a paywall. Pay for public radio, pay for public television. You gotta pay for what you want or you're not gonna get real news. You're gonna get the people who are spamming us with disinformation via Facebook and Twitter and so many other things. So put your money where your mouth is and support good news gathering and information. All right. I want to thank the organizers of this tremendous conference. I want to thank our amazing speakers. Please join me in, or in thanking everyone who put it together. <laughs> and <laughs> yeah, that's it. <laughs> oh, it's amazing.